Marty Risky is a true entrepreneur. I think he once told me that over the course of his professional life, he's been involved in more than 20 startup businesses. Not only has he started businesses, but he started very successful businesses. And this may come as a shock to the politicians who think that only government can create jobs, but he's never taken a dime from the government. Marty is a great supporter of the North Dakota Policy Council. He challenges me every time I talk to him. The first time we met, we had lunch at a little place in Fargo. And I'll never forget this. He, the, the, one of the first questions he asked me was, do you think North Dakota should secede from the Union? <laughs> and he, 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 I was a young punk kid who thought he knew everything about politics and economics. And I can't imagine the look I had on my face when he asked me that. <laughs> but that's what Marty does. He challenges me to think about things that normally aren't thought about. And I'm very grateful for that. Marty's love of freedom and healthy skepticism of everything that government does is a breath of fresh air. I've asked Marty to introduce our first speaker today. With that, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Marty Risky. Thank you for that kind introduction. As an entrepreneur who is responsible for the livelihood of more than 150 employees, my daily concern is how do we adapt to our changing environment in order to best meet the needs of our customers? The writers of the great U.S. Constitution knew that politics prevents government from having the same concern. Therefore, they presented a law that would reduce the impact of government upon people. Today, the headlines are full of bankruptcies, unfathomable debt, and reckless spending without audits. The Constitution has been set aside by clever and deceitful men. The results of our government over the past 100 years are bringing pressure on businesses of all kinds, and millions are suffering lack of employment. We need a prescription, a recipe, a four-lane highway to take us out of this mess. Dr. Thomas E. Woods, Jr. has the vision to not only see how we got here, but the vision to get us back to a free economy that made us a nation every world citizen wanted to emulate. Dr. Woods is a senior fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. He holds a bachelor's degree in history from Harvard and got his master's and doctorate degrees from Columbia University. He has written history books, economics books, and history books about economics. He's appeared on many cable news shows and popular radio shows. His latest book became a New York Times bestseller. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy and excited to present to you the author of the best-selling book, Meltdown, Dr. Tom Woods. Ladies and gentlemen. Okay, well, wonderful to be here. This is the first time I've ever been to North Dakota. And I had, because there is no direct flight, unfortunately, to Bismarck from Atlanta. So while I was sitting during my three hour layover, and I pretty much, you know, there's only so much you can do after three hours. You know, I pretty much mastered the wing of the <laughs> Minneapolis airport. So I started to uh, make a list of the states I've been to. I mean, this is really, it's really desperate. It's like you're, you know, in the middle of your dissertation and you're looking up in the phone book to see, just out of curiosity, if there's anybody named Stalin in Manhattan. You know, just sort of crazy thing you find yourself doing. Not that that's ever happened to me. But there I was, and I, I was surprised. I actually thought of all 50 states, and thanks to you people, I'm up to 37, so I'm really glad to have this opportunity. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, normally, you know, I'm kind of jokey. Uh, you know, I like to tell jokes and, you know, keep things light, and I'll try my best to do that. But at the same time, I want to cover so much information in this one hour that I have you here uh, in Bismarck that I'm probably going to have to dispense with some of that. I don't want you to walk away thinking, well, this bum wasn't funny at all. I mean, I am funny. <laughs> it's just, you know, I have to budget my time as wisely as possible. Uh, secondly, 
I, I, I do get 60 minutes according to the schedule. So even though we're slightly off, I think I'm going to take my 60 minutes because, I, as I say, I've, I've got to include all this, all this information. So off we go. The free market economy is under attack almost as never before because we are being told that the free market has failed and anybody who believes in it is some kind of a stupid rube and what we really need is for our overlords in Washington to get more power in order to see us through this terrible crisis. I mean this conventional wisdom is absolutely everywhere. It is very very difficult to find any dissent whatever from this. Now it's very difficult also to satisfy the critics of the free market because when you reply to one of their criticisms, they just pull out another one. That's what Joseph Schumpeter meant when he said they've already got the verdict in their pockets, so the arguments will keep changing. But the verdict is the market stinks and we need something else. So it used to be, believe it or not, the case that socialists would argue the problem with the free market was it was not as efficient as socialism would be. It would not produce goods in as great abundance and in great quality as socialism would because the argument was that the free market duplicates effort. You know, look, you have all these different breakfast cereals. You know, we don't need all these different cereals, right? We need maybe three cereals. The rest of it's just wasted duplication of effort. So the argument was that the free market can't produce in the type of, uh, with the type of efficiency that we'll become accustomed to when socialism triumphs. Well, now nobody in his right mind believes that anymore. So instead of arguing that the, the market doesn't produce enough, now the argument is the market produces too much. It produces in such great abundance that it's making everybody fat and materialistic. So there's no satisfying these people. It, it doesn't produce enough. It produces too much. It's never, there's no way to satisfy them. Now there are people who believe that economics is some dull discipline. You know, you can't possibly be interested in this. It's just, just a big bore. Well, it is an unbelievable triumph of mainstream economics that they have somehow managed to persuade people that economics is boring. In the way it's normally presented, it is kind of boring. In fact, one indicator that economics has become unspeakably and indeed grotesquely boring is that a study was done not too long ago to discover how many people read the typical article in the American Economic Review, really the flagship journal of the profession. The answer? 2.5 people read the average article. So there's a half a guy running around <laughs> reading articles. I mean, th that's not good, right? And the reason is, of course, they've turned economics into a field of just incomprehensible jargon, uh, but most of all, uh, it's, it's so math, uh, math, math, mathematized, let's say, that the average person can't possibly follow it, but he is sort of overawed by all the math into thinking, well, something really important must be going on here. These economists must be doing something that a lowly peon like me can't possibly understand. It's, a lot of it's basically just a scam. And, it is the case that earlier in the 20th century, those people who wanted to transform economics into just nothing but you know, an ape of, of physics, really, and filled with all these mathematical formulas, this was viewed as kind of a weird, kind of cultish subset of the field. But now the cult has taken over the profession. And so what we are going to talk about today, what I, certainly what I'm talking about, is a, is a field, or, well, not really a field, but a kind of a subset of economics that I, I consider to be real economics and that what passes for economics today is a, is a pale substitute for the real thing. And what I'm referring to is something called the Austrian School of Economics, which is a school of thought that is in fact the oldest continuous school of thought in economics still in existence today. It is right now also the smallest of the schools but at the same time, it is also far and away the fastest growing. And especially among up-and-coming young scholars who look at the, the, the math and all the technical jargon of mainstream economics, and it just seems so passe, so 1990s, so, you know, so, you know, 80-year-old guy sort of economics, whereas the Austrian school seems sort of cool and cutting edge and seems like it has something relevant to say. And the fact that the Austrians overwhelmingly predicted that this crisis was coming 
speaks very much in its favor and has helped to attract so much interest in it. The economist James Galbraith, a left-wing economist, argued that of the roughly 15,000 economists in the United States, perhaps 10 or 12 predicted there would be an economic crisis. Well, of course, this propagandist is excluding hundreds and hundreds of economists from the Austrian school who have all been saying, uh, hello, back here, there's a crisis coming. And in effect, what we've had is a guy at the head of the lecture hall saying, oh, I guess there are no questions. All right, we'll end, we'll end the discussion. The Austrians have been saying this for years. So why is it? Why did the Austrians see this coming? Do they have a crystal ball? Are they using a Ouija board? What is it that made it possible for them to see this coming? And that specific point I'll cover at the very end. But now I just want to introduce to you this Austrian school of economic thought. And we associate with this school a number of important economists, but the two perhaps most well-known would be Ludwig von Mises, who died in uh, 1973, and F.A. Hayek, who died about 15 or so, maybe 17 years ago. Hayek actually won the Nobel Prize in economics, and I'll be talking about his Nobel Prize a little later. If you look at Mises' book, Human Action, it's 900 pages long. Bob Murphy wrote the study guide to human action because some people may find it a little difficult to get through a 900-page book on economics you know, on their own. But there isn't even a graph in this book. Not one graph, nothing. It's just all text. And Mises is making a point about that, about the nature of economics and what we're really doing as economists. We're not playing games with numbers. We're using human reason and applying it to important problems. Now, economics teaches us that there are cause and effect relationships that exist in the world in the realm of human interaction. There are cause and effect relationships also in the realm of uh, projectiles and physical inanimate objects, but there are also cause and effect relationships of a qualitative sort that exist in the world when humans interact with, human beings interact with each other. And these cause and effect relationships are real. So that if the government should say tomorrow that it's sick and tired of high milk prices, so it is going to declare that milk will not be sold for more than 10 cents a gallon, that does not mean that we're going to have an abundance of milk. Everyone will now be able to get milk at 10 cents a gallon. Nobody will be able to get milk because fewer people will supply it at that price and more people will demand it. So the combination of these factors means there will be hardly any milk available for anybody. So that's a, that's a fact, that's a, that's a law. There's no getting around that. There is, economics is part of the structure of reality. And reality is merciless. It does not allow you to escape. Reality is always there. And that's why, as Mises said, dictators hate economists. They hate good economists. They, they wouldn't hate the lapdog economists we have now who flatter our overlords by telling them exactly what they want to hear, that they are the great men who can, through printing money out of thin air or borrowing money, they can create prosperity. But a real economist, a real economist is hated by the dictator because the real economist tells the dictator that you can blab and yell and scream all you want, but you can't avoid the fact that price controls lead to shortages. You can't avoid the fact that when you increase the supply of money, you will get prices that are higher than they would have been otherwise. There are certain facts that you cannot deny. And no dictator wants to be told that there are any fetters on his will. Mises said, an economist can never be a favorite of autocrats and demagogues. With them, he is always the mischief maker. And the more they are inwardly convinced that his objections are well-founded, the more they hate him. Now, the free market itself is really not difficult to define. It is simply the nexus of exchanges that take place when human beings interact with each other. That human beings in a free market can enter into contracts with each other and they can make exchanges with each other using uh, their own labor services, their own property, as long as they do not interfere with the physical integrity of the person or property of anybody else. That's all it is. That's it. That's all it is. Now, let's, let's say a little something about the Austrian school and how it works, because this is Free Market Economics 101. I want to give you an indication of how 
economics is supposed to go, how it's supposed to work, how it arrives at its conclusions. And I hope you'll find that it is actually a very impressive, elegant intellectual system. It's not boring. And the, the things it teaches are not arbitrary. They are, in fact, undeniably true. Now, Mises himself argued that what we do is we begin uh, in, in what he called praxeology, which is the science of human action. We begin with the fact, the so-called action axiom, the fact that human beings act. And by action, he means that human beings aim at ends. They aim at, and when I say an end, I, I mean this in the philosophical sense of goals or purposes, that we are goal or purpose oriented in our action. And that when we employ the scarce means of this world in the pursuit of some end, what we are doing is trying to substitute a more satisfactory state of affairs for a less satisfactory state of affairs. Mises used to say that all action is prompted by some felt uneasiness. And we act when we believe that by pursuing our action, we will be able to remove or alleviate this uneasiness. And that in the wake of the action, we will be better off than we would have been if we had not performed that action. Now that's not to say that we're, sometimes we're not, you know, we might not be mistaken. Sometimes you may think that, you know, this steak will taste better than it really will. You, know, you may make some type of mistake, but at least ex ante, uh, before you engage in the action, your assessment, uh, your appraisal, of the consequences of this action are that it will make you better off and remove this uneasiness uh, as opposed to what would have happened if you had not taken the action. Now it's impossible basically to refute this because if you were to say human beings don't act then you are in fact employing the scarce means of your vocal cords and your brain in order to pursue the end of trying to prove that nobody pursues ends basically so you'd be contradicting yourself. So we have this axiom human beings act and what follows from this are important implications for economics, believe it or not. We can, we can see that are contained in the very implication of, of uh, in the very existence of human action. We can see that there are certain things implied. Um, when I act, I am choosing things. The, world, the resources in this world are scarce. That is to say, they cannot possibly fulfill every conceivable end I may wish to pursue. And even if all goods existed in superabundance, such that as soon as I desired them, I could instantly acquire them in whatever quantities I wanted. Even if we lived in that world, I would still have to make choices because I would still be confronted with the scarcity of time and the scarcity of my own body. I cannot, in the nature of things, simultaneously fulfill all the ends I may wish to pursue. So even if all the physical means in this world were instantaneously available to me in superabundance, I would still have to choose which one do I want to pursue now, which one do I want to pursue later. So the very fact of choice uh, implies the existence of costs. Because when I do one thing, I necessarily set aside the opportunity to do a different thing. As I say, I cannot fulfill all potential goals simultaneously. That's not, not possible given the nature of the world. So I have to have a ranking, an implicit ranking in my mind of all the ends I may wish to pursue. And so therefore, when I act, I choose the most valued end on my value scale, and I pursue that value. But there is a cost involved in pursuing that action. And the cost is the second most highly valued end. That is to say, the end that I would have pursued if I hadn't pursued the first one. So I might have had a ham sandwich if I hadn't had the turkey sandwich. So there is some cost involved. And that is the action that is necessarily foregone. So given that I possess a value scale, we can also derive from this in effect, the law of demand, or we can, in fact, before we even go to the law of demand, the law of diminishing marginal utility. Now, this seems very technical, but it's actually not difficult to understand. This law simply tells us that the utility of each additional unit of a good decreases as the supply of units increases. And what that means simply is this. Let's suppose I have four units of water. I have a value scale that tells me how I'm going to allocate these units of water. The first unit of water I may want to apply to drinking, the second to bathing, the third to watering my plants, and the fourth to washing my car. 
That's my value scale. And you can see me, you can see that this value scale exists by observing my action. That my first priority is to drink. Well, let's suppose I lost one of these units of water, or for some reason I could acquire only three units. Does that mean that this week I'll just say, well, guess I can't drink this week? Well, of course, obviously I'll still drink with the remaining water, but I will go without the least valued end that I could have pursued if I had had that fourth unit, namely the washing of my car. I'll go without that. And so what this implies then, this, this, the existence of this value scale, is that the increment of satisfaction that I derive from each additional unit of a good becomes smaller and smaller because with each additional unit of a good I'm applying that good to a less urgently, less highly valued end on my value scale. So the first one for drinking is obviously of very great importance to me. I derive a great increment of satisfaction from having that unit of water as opposed to having zero units. But then the unit that I acquire for bathing, well okay, the increment is, is somewhat smaller. Bathing for me is a less valued end than drinking. So this is in fact the law of diminishing marginal utility. And to derive this law it is not necessary to introduce um, concepts of, of um, psychological or physiological satiety. It doesn't mean that you know, I, I get full when I eat a lot of ice cream, or I get full when I drink a lot of water, or psychologically I only want this or that. It's implied in the very existence of human action that we have, as we've seen, that we have costs, we have value scales, and that therefore, because on our value scales we always pursue the most highest, the, the highest valued end, any additional ends that we can fulfill with an increasing supply of a good will be applied to less valued ends and hence we have the idea that the utility that we acquire from each additional good is going to be less and less over time. Well this is just simply an implication of human action. There's no need to go out and test this theory. There's no need to interview people psychologically. It follows necessarily from the concept of action. And now that we've taken all this that, that seems obvious to people, we think, well yeah, of course I, I realize all this. But to spell it out is very important because it has implications for economics. And that is, now I'm going to stray a bit, stray, stray. We're out here now in no man's land with no <laughs> microphone. And that is that you can put up here this sort of thing you see in any old, you know, even a high school textbook. We can, we can derive the existence of a demand curve. Now this is price plotted here and quantity here of a given good. So let's say, uh, you know, how, how is it that I, what, what, what does this mean? What this means is that as, as, uh, as the price of a, of, a, um, of a good goes up, do, 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 the amount of it that I will typically demand will be lower and lower. Now, but why, why is that? Why would that be? Is this just an arbitrary construct of economists? Well, it follows from what I just said, that as I acquire additional units of a good, I'm necessarily going to be applying them to less and less valued ends. And so therefore, I'm going to be willing to part with less in order to acquire additional units of a good. So in order for me to be willing to acquire more, to go out farther this way on the x-axis, the price is going to have to be correspondingly lower in order, to, in order for me to be interested. Because at this point, when I acquire additional units of the good, I'm going to be you know, applying them to very, very uh, minimal ends on my, on my value scale. So this fact, this, this existence of this law of marginal utility, in fact, implies that we have a demand curve on the part of consumers that is downward sloping to the right. There's no reason to assume, by the way, that it's perfectly straight. This is it could be jagged. But the idea is that it moves downward because um, we're only willing to acquire additional quantities at lower prices. For this reason, so again, this is not arbitrary. There's nothing arbitrary about this. Now, I'm going to return to that a little later to, sh to show how, how it can be used. But this is really just giving graphical representation to something that we can understand just through normal speech without, without the use of mathematics. So all of this stuff just follows from the existence of human action. Again, we, haven't, we don't go out and interview people. We don't, this is totally unnecessary. It, it, is, it is a necessary consequence of how human action is, uh, uh, the nature of it. Now we have prices on a free market. Where do prices come from? Prices, uh, prices come from the interaction of buyers and sellers on the market. Now you might think prices just come from, you know, the, the company puts a price on its good and that's where the price comes from. 
Well, that can't be right because, you know, what if the company put, uh, you know, some bread company put a price of a million dollars on a loaf of bread? That's not going to be the end of the pricing process, I guarantee you, because they're going to get some feedback from the consuming public. When nobody buys any bread, they're going to have to change the price. So prices come about, and, and I'm obviously dramatically oversimplifying this, um, but prices necessarily involve the interaction of, of um, buyers and sellers, or, or, or will uh, typically involve the interaction of buyers and sellers on the market. Now, with the price system, the market is able to coordinate production in a way that is really astonishing when we look at it uh, up close. Because we, we sort of take all this for granted, that you know you go to the supermarket, there are, there are a million goods there, and it's almost to us like this just happens automatically. You know, we don't even need to explain it. But it is an extraordinary thing that without central direction of any kind, you can produce a box of cereal, or you can produce a pen. In fact, um, I want to just cite for you what economist George Reisman says just about the production of a pen and all the production processes that necessarily must come together for the production of a pen and given that no human being, no one person could possibly master all the scientific knowledge that is necessary to bring about all the production processes necessary to bring about a pen it's astonishing that the voluntarily produced prices on a free market nevertheless coordinate this without any pen czar overseeing it. <laughs> so here's what Reisman says. He says, to make the pen, far more knowledge is required than is possessed by the producers of the pen. They can begin with the purchase of plastic and ink and pen points and various types of machinery. What they know is how to produce such pens from this stage on. But others must know how to produce the plastic, the ink, the points, and the equipment. Still others must know how to produce the petrochemicals from which the plastic comes, the various chemicals from which the ink is made, the metals from wh which the points are produced, and the components for the equipment. At further stages of remove from the pen, yet still others must know how to refine petroleum, how to explore for it, drill for it, and store and transport it, how to produce the drilling and refining equipment, the parts and materials to make that equipment, and so on. Tracing now the chemicals for the ink, the metals for the points, and the components for the pen making equipment further back, we are led into the chemical industry, the mining industry, and the machine tool industry. At practically all stages we encounter the construction industry, which had to erect the various factories involved, the electric power industry, which provides the factories and machines with light and power, and the transportation industry, which moves the various products and means of production to where they are required. And these industries lead us back to the industries producing the materials and equipment they in turn require. We find that the production of a seemingly simple product like a ballpoint pen is not so simple after all. It is closely tied to the production of most of the rest of the economic system in a virtual spider web of complexity, which with threads running back and across to almost every other branch of industry in ways that are too complex even to be completely and accurately named by anyone, let alone actually understood in the way required for production. The fact that people are not amazed at this is one of the reasons that there is hostility toward the free market. The fact that anyone could think that's an automatic process that just happens. The very fact that it happens without central direction is astonishing and it is by and large uh, through the price system that resources are directed to their most highly valued and urgently demanded uses. Something called the uniformity, we might call the uniformity of profit principle helps to drive this process. Let us say that suddenly there is an increase in demand for pens over pencils. Uh, and a, a huge increase in demand. That, uh, let's say the conventional wisdom becomes that only a loser uses a pencil. You know, you don't want to be some loser. All the cool kids have pens. So suddenly, there's a, uh, there's a great demand for pens. Well, the pen industry is going to enjoy uh, a sudden a windfall because they're going to enjoy higher profits. Well, those higher profits, which they calculate using the price system, will then in turn attract more producers into the pen industry in search of that profit. And there will tend to be, in general, a moving out of the pencil industry. Resources, capital will move out of the pencil industry, and you'll see resources and capital coming from various parts of the economy into the pen industry in pursuit of these profits. Well, the increased supply of pens that will therefore be brought about will then tend to push those excess, I don't want to say excess in a moral sense, but will tend to uh, push the profits down back to a sort of uniform level.
And so, again, the price system and the existence of profit is what attracts additional production of things people demand. And it's to make sure that we're not producing a million things nobody wants and that we are producing things that there's a demand for. So profit reflects the fact that producers are producing things that the public demands. And if you're enjoying uh, tremendously high profits, you're going to, on a free market, attract more producers to produce more of the things that people demand. And that's why it's so nonsensical to use that phrase that you see on bumper stickers, people, not profits. That's totally nonsensical. What do you think profit is? It's a reflection that a business is serving the people. If it makes, what, what do they want? Should we have uh, losses instead? I mean, would that be better? Would that be more pro-people if we suffered losses? The, the firms suffering losses are suffering them because they're not satisfying the consumer. Why would that be an improvement? Profits indicate that you are doing what the public wants. You are taking inputs and transforming them into things that are more valued and that the public demands. That's a good thing, and profit uh, is what make sure that our factors of production are moved into areas that correspond with consumer demand. This would also be this case with, let's, let's say people, everybody wants to go on a diet. And suddenly everybody wants low-fat food. I mean, even McDonald's at, at one point. McDonald's didn't always sell salads. You know, I mean, that, this would have been unthinkable in the 70s. A salad at McDonald's? But when there's an increased demand for low-fat food, and profits therefore increase for those who are making low-fat food, everybody wants to get in on it. And so again, you don't need a low-fat food czar. You, all you need is the profit system, profit and loss, and it directs capital where it's most um, urgently demanded. Now, let's think about a world where you had no prices in the factors of production. Let's imagine a pure socialist society. Because socialism, as it was classically considered, was a system in which the means of production, that is the factories, the capital equipment, all this stuff, is owned by the state. That's, that's the, how, how the system would work. There's one owner, namely the state. It owns all the stuff. Now, Mises wrote a, an influential article, uh, not influential enough, unfortunately, in 1920 called Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. And what he argued was that, strictly speaking, uh, a socialist society, is, uh, a socialist economy is impossible. And what he means by that is as follows, that let's suppose you have that system, and all the means of production are owned by one single entity, namely the government. Well, if there's only one owner, there's going to be any buying and selling. Like you, think of the property you own. You don't sit and play, you don't buy and say, oh, I think I'll buy this bottle of water for myself. Like this would be stupid. Like you wouldn't do that. So if there's only one owner of everything, of all the means of production anyway, there's no buying and selling that goes on. The, the government already owns it all. There's no buying and selling. And if there's no buying and selling, the process that gives rise to market prices is stymied from the start. So there are no prices of any of the factors of production. So therefore, when the central planning board decides, okay, we're going to produce these products and we're going to use this particular method and this combination of capital goods and we're going to produce them in this location, in this quantity, all those decisions are totally arbitrary. In a free market, a producer has prices, he's, he's working within the context of a price system, so he can calculate profit and loss. If he's making losses, then he can go back and say, well, let's see, maybe if I used this input instead, I would make a profit. Well, there's no way, if you don't have prices, if you can't evaluate the cost of your inputs, because there's no prices of your inputs, you have no way of knowing if you're making a profit or you're making a loss, so you have no way of knowing, are you serving the public or are you hurting the public? Are you adding value or are you destroying value? Are you using resources efficiently or are you using them in ways that are ludicrously and destructively uneconomic? Like why don't we make cars out of platinum, for example? Now I don't know if the platinum is rigorous enough to be used in this production process. The point I'm making is why do we not use it? Well the price is prohibitive. And, and that's, that's the way of saying, look, if you want to use platinum, buddy, you better have a really, really important use for it because it's really scarce and it's being demanded elsewhere. But when you have a system where there's only one giant owner, 
Not only can you not calculate profit and loss because there's no there are no costs associated with your inputs. You can't there's no number figure. You can't calculate. You can't tell if you're making a profit. You can't tell if you're wasting resources. In a free market, if you waste resources, you make losses, and that's the economy's way of saying stop wasting resources. The central planning board has no way of knowing that. But also because it's only one owner, we don't have the phenomenon we have in a free market. We're in a free market if some particular good, like some metal or some input in a production process, is really urgently demanded in some sector, that sector can bid that supply away to itself, can get it from areas where it's really not so urgently needed. This sector is willing to pay a higher price for it, this, this sector can get it. But if there's only one owner, there's no way for one sector to, to pull resources toward it. So platinum can be being used for absurd, totally wasteful things. And so imagine a whole system like this. I mean, there are probably trillions of possible ways you can produce various products and different combinations. There's no way to know if, which one makes sense if you don't have a profit and loss feedback. And you can have that only through prices. You can have that only through private property. So right at the heart of the socialist system is a flaw so devastating that it can't possibly work. And one of the reasons that it was able to work was that in part, some of these socialist systems were really actually just very, very, very heavily interventionist systems that did in fact allow some private property. But also, these socialist planning boards could use the prices that the capitalist countries were using. They could just draw these prices off a world market and use them as a kind of very, very crude and rough approximation. But if you had a whole world that had gone socialist and everything was totally arbitrary and no calculation was possible, you would revert to barbarism. Now we can sometimes appreciate the free market better when we see it taken away from us. So suppose we have, instead of free prices that direct resources to their most urgently valued purposes, let's suppose we have price controls. Now some of you remember price controls um, during the 70s. So we've got price controls because that's going to keep prices low for everybody and that'll make everybody better off. Well, I mean, you know, consider what happens here. Now let's suppose, now we'll go back here to my super sophisticated diagram here. Now just because I'm, I'm you know, I'm in a super, super, super time squeeze here, uh, I'm not going to derive the, where the supply curve comes from, but we'll just put it up here. I can tell you that later over coffee. But the point is that here's the curve representing uh, the demand schedule. This is a supply schedule for, let's say, that some good they're putting, let's say it's milk. So, you know, okay, this is where supply and demand of milk converge. And this is, you know, this is roughly where, at this price and this quantity, this is where you're going to see milk sold under these circumstances. And again, this whole thing is just derived from just logic, logical implication of action. Now, let's say the government says, uh, no, you know, milk's too high. We're gonna, the price for milk we want to put is right here. And this will be great. Everybody will have milk really cheaply. It's going to be the best thing ever. Like, why didn't we think of this before? Well, the reason you didn't think of it before is, is this. Okay, so let's go with this price. Well, let's see how much is going to be supplied. Well, here's the quantity that's going to be supplied here, but here's the quantity that's going to be demanded, right here. So right here is where you're going to have a shortage because you've got much more demand than is being supplied. That's the problem. So this, as I say, you, you, can, you can derive all this just from, just from the implications of action. Now think about, and we, we often, oftentimes we hear, well, we need to have price controls during emergencies. You know, because then we don't want to have price gougers. These are anti-social creatures, you know, who probably deserve the death penalty. Can't have that. So, for instance, uh, you know, let's say, well, let's say it's, it's raining in some small town, and everybody feels like, you know, uh, you should have an umbrella. Well, the umbrella seller is probably going to increase the, the uh, price of umbrellas. Uh, and, and, and people will say, oh, isn't that terrible? You're taking terrible advantage. But look at the socially valuable function that performs. If umbrellas are at the same price they were at when rain was normal, I might buy four umbrellas for, for me, for, you know, for my wife, one of my kids, and you know, even, even my cat might get like a little cat umbrella. <laughs> but suppose the price goes up. Then I look at it and I say, well, you know, my cat's getting the umbrella. My wife, you know, I don't know. <laughs> So I will buy fewer umbrellas, and what does that mean? More umbrellas available for other people. So in other words, if I rush out at the old prices, and I'm buying umbrellas and, and applying them to really trivial purposes, you know, like pet umbrellas, this is really an antisocial act. The market sort of prevents me from doing it. 
saying, oh, look, you know, you can't be doing that right now because people urgently need these umbrellas. Or if there's a need for hotel space, there's been some disaster. Well, again, people say, oh, I can't believe the price of a hotel room is going up. It's a good thing it goes up. If the price of a hotel room was still $39, well, everybody would get his own room, and half the population would have nowhere to stay. Whereas this way, okay, you might have to bump, you know, four people in a room, but it means now three other people have shelter who wouldn't have had it otherwise. This is how the free market makes sure that basically people's needs are cared for in light of the existing supply. It also makes sure, again, that people aren't using stuff for really trivial reasons, that you're only using the, the good that is, uh, there's, a, there's currently great demand for, you're only using it for the most highly valued of your ends. Whereas if you put price controls in, you know, hey, I might still, um, uh, you know, I might still use, use uh, my money to buy umbrellas and still buy umbrellas for all four of my uh, family members. Or let's say there's a, there's a big rush on lumber because a lot of people's homes got destroyed. And let's suppose the government uh, allows, in this case, a free market in lumber. Well, the price of lumber is going to get bid up dramatically because there's going to be huge demand for it now. Well, what that, the great socially valuable purpose that that serves is that if there's some guy in Cincinnati who is considering building a doghouse and suddenly he finds the price of lumber has doubled, he probably won't do it. And that way, that's lumber that's available to rebuild people's houses. And again, how do we bring this about? Is it because we had a lumber czar saying, listen, don't anybody build a doghouse? That was the free market being allowed to work. And then he realizes that, well, I'll have to wait and build the doghouse another time. And meanwhile, that lumber gets bit away. We don't need slavery. We don't need concentration camps. We don't need re-education. We just need the voluntary interaction of buyers and sellers, and we can have our, our needs satisfied. Okay. Um Oh, goodness gracious. Okay, all right. Well, let's see. Again, I'm going with my full 60 minutes, so I am intending to do this. Um, I, I, I'm going to say um, something about wages, just very briefly, because this one I, I used to get all the time. One criticism of the free market is this sense that, uh, you know, the free market really only benefits the rich, and, you know, you, you have to be some kind of miser to favor the free market, which is just an absolutely absurd statement. I mean, there is no system ever in the history of mankind that has lifted more people out of poverty than the free market. And if you look around the world, where in the world are the poor not as bad off? And it's always in the market societies, always. So we have this fact, with the fact that, you know, in 1820 or so, there were about 80% of the world population living in what we would call extreme poverty. Well, that's down to about a quarter of the population. Uh, and, and that's at a time when the sheer numbers of people have increased dramatically. Now, this is a miracle, basically a miracle, but again, it's just taken for granted. It's assumed that this is a natural process, has nothing to do with the free market. That is the free market, uh, because it makes the production of goods uh, so much more efficient. You can produce in such greater abundance. It makes all these miracles possible. Uh, but another thing, I remember when I, was, when I was in high school, the impression I got was that if you believed in the free market, then... What followed from that is you believe in um, big businessmen who ruthlessly exploit workers and you want to have a system where everybody works for three cents an hour and you know they're just crawling around eating dirt and their kids are, are, are working in mines all day and, and that's what the free market gives you and only the government can rescue us from these wicked people. Isn't it funny? That's always the answer. You know, I mean, we've got wicked people out there but only our wise overlords can save us from them. Well, this sort of comic book version of history and economics is taught everywhere. Everywhere, absolutely everywhere, and so I don't blame people for believing it. I mean, what else are you supposed to believe? That's what you get told all the time. But the, the basic answer to that is as follows. Let's suppose, um, suppose you have a system, where, suppose, suppose in our day today, suppose all the machines that we use to produce things, all the assembly lines, everything, they're all destroyed. And we have to go back to making everything by hand or just using the most primitive contraptions. Let's suppose our whole communications infrastructure is destroyed and all we have now is the telegraph. Let's suppose that our transportation system is almost completely destroyed and all we have are horses and buggies and some trains. Now, then let's suppose every American worker said, but you know what, even under these conditions, I think I'll just work 40 hours a week. Well, what do you think would happen? We'd all die. Now, why would we die? Because 40 hours of work under those conditions would produce a tiny, tiny pittance of what we are used to consuming. 
I mean, if you had all those machines back and you worked 40 hours a week, you could produce an enormous amount, enough to feed everybody, clothe everybody, entertain everybody. But now if you're working 40 hours a week and you're, you're making stuff by hand, you're, you're producing, I don't know, one one thousandth of what you used to produce. So you still want to work the same amount and you th the result will be you will produce, the economy will produce so little that everybody will find the prices of these things are going to be so high people will barely be able to eke out an existence. Now, in this circumstance, would the reason that we're poor be that the businessmen are exploiting us and they're just charging high prices for no reason and giving us low wages for no reason? Obviously not. It's because the economy is so unmechanized this is all it can physically produce. It wouldn't be that the reason that there were no television sets is that the greedy businessmen were hogging them all. It would be that this economy is not physically capable of producing television sets or in any kind of abundance at all. Well, that's exactly the economy people lived in in the late 18th century, early 19th century, exactly that. Very, very, very primitive means of production. So, but yet we're told the reason people had low, low wages in those days is that businessmen were just wickedly depriving people of wages and, and uh, if only they had been forced to pay them more, everything would have been better. That economy, they were living through what I just described as what would be a nightmare for us. That was their ordinary life. So obviously people are going to be at a low standard of living. Obviously, if, if, if they're going to have to work many times the hours we work now, even to eke out a bare level of subsistence, simply because their economy is not physically capable of producing anymore. So instead of focusing us on, oh, look at the greedy businessmen, we need to you know, throw them in prison or something, we need to think about how can we get this economy to be more physically productive so that people's real incomes will buy them more stuff. So what really happens, the way the free market increases, improves our standard of living, is that on the free market, businesses make profits, and they plow those profits back into their businesses, and they buy capital goods that allow them to produce more consumer goods and at lower prices than before. They buy steam shovels instead of regular shovels. They use forklifts instead of their bare hands. And now you can produce many, many times the goods you could before. And the force of competition will then translate these lower costs into lower prices for consumers. Now in our case, we typically don't see prices going down because our Federal Reserve System keeps prices going up. But we still see the process at work nevertheless when prices fall uh, uh, probably, probably when prices rise not as fast as wages. So the important thing is what we need is to make the economy more physically productive. Let's get, as, as in our nightmare scenario, let's somehow reverse the nightmare. Let's get the machines back and then you don't need to work as many hours to produce the physical abundance and then because there's abundance you'll get lower prices for these things and the dollars you earn will extend much farther. That's the solution to the problem and we see this empirically in American history. That if you compare the year 2000 with the year 1950 or 1900, and I do this in uh, one of my books, 33 Questions, uh, and you look at how many hours did somebody have to work in order to earn the purchasing power necessary to buy a pair of jeans, a three pound chicken, uh, some electricity, a long distance telephone call, whatever it is, uh, an automobile, it is far lower in the year 2000. And that's because our economy is far more mechanized, it's more capital intensive, it, it is more physically productive, and therefore I don't need to work 160 hours a week uh, to produce the same amount to feed and provide for everybody. I can, produce, I can work much less and the proceeds of what I earn because there's such a great abundance of goods will get me a larger and larger share of those goods. Now that is the opposite of what you're taught in school which tells you the government is, is the reason that people are doing well and labor unions are why workers get higher wages. That is exactly the opposite of the truth. Everything that both of those institutions have done has actually um, worsened the condition of labor. Now I realize that's a very controversial statement for me to make without elaboration. Uh, it is in two of my American history books, however, and we can speak informally. But I, I don't want to finish 
without at least a brief overview about the current situation. Um, and uh, by my reckoning, I've got roughly 15 minutes to, to have been about 60. So 15 minutes should just about do it to account for why we've had a total collapse and your stock portfolio is down by 50%. That should just about do it. So Bob can help uh, elaborate on this too because uh, obviously he's, he's an expert on business cycle theory. But the long and the short of it is, is this, and, the, and my book Meltdown applies what I'm about to tell you to the current situation. And I, I, um, you know, I, I can't guarantee that you'll win all your arguments with your friends if you read this book, but I'm almost tempted to say m maybe I'll give you like half back on your purchase price if you don't. I mean, I don't know. I, all right, so I'm going to do my best. A any of you, by the way, who woke up this morning and were watching C-SPAN 2 at 9.30 heard me talking about this very thing. So if I use the same metaphors, don't say, what a jip, you know, I just saw this on TV. These metaphors work, okay? That's why I use them. All right, the, the really quick version of what's going on here is as follows. That what we're often, what we're getting when we're getting commentary about the current economic crisis is normally focus on symptoms rather than ultimate causes. And I want to get to ultimate causes. I mean, the left wing, don't they always talk about, you got to get to the root causes of crime. Well, I don't know why they don't want to get to the root causes of the economic crisis. They want to say greed caused it. Yeah, greed, a subjective state of mind, could somehow have caused a global financial meltdown? Well, I mean, my, I mean, why are these people not even slightly curious? At, why is that greed seems to appear, you know, it seems to recur on a sort of regular basis every certain number of years, and it's, it appears cyclically, and every time we see it, we see the same sort of characteristics, like capital goods industries get hit harder than retail, and what, like, if it were just greed, why would we see these regularities. Like, there's no curiosity about this whatsoever. It's just greed. Well, I want to suggest there's a, there's a systemic problem here. And the systemic problem is the Federal Reserve System, which is not part of the free market. The Federal Reserve System is created by an act of Congress, and without its government-granted monopoly privilege to create legal tender money out of thin air, the Fed would be nothing. So the government is at the heart of this. Now, to make a long story short, and I explain this both on my website and the book in you know, easy to understand language, but the Fed's intervention into the market creates or uh, gives rise to uh, perverse consequences that would not have occurred in the absence of the Fed's intervention. Now, F.A. Hayek won the Nobel Prize for this. He won the Nobel Prize for a theory known as the Austrian business cycle theory that explains why the free market is not to blame for the fact the economy goes on these up and down cycles where we're doing great, then we're doing badly, then we're doing great, then we're doing badly. There's no reason that that should be. Yes, some businesses will go out of business because nobody is an infallible forecaster of the future, but why would they all do well and they all kind of do badly? Like why, especially given this fact, the free market sorts out the good entrepreneurs from the bad ones. People who are terrible at forecasting consumer demand suffer losses. And if they stink at it, they go out of business entirely, and their resources get, shift to more comp get shifted to more competent people. Well, so therefore, there's a selection process on the market. Capital is always being moved toward people who have a track record of being good at it, of employing it in the service of consumer demand. Why should these people all suddenly become so bad at this, so dreadfully bad, that they're all making the same kind of error in the same direction. I mean, isn't this at least kind of interesting? Instead of just saying, well, you know, this just happens, I don't know, it's a psychological thing, I don't know. Well, that's a totally unsatisfying answer. Why does this happen? Hayek thinks he's hit upon the answer. And the answer basically runs as follows, uh, again, very quickly. Is when, we, when we think about the function that interest rates will perform when they're left alone, and they perform important functions for us. And the two I'm going to focus on are really sort of two sides of the same coin. Number one is really that um, interest rates coordinate production over time. By which I mean they make sure that, uh, that businesses are going to embark on long-term projects who are going to bear fruit only in the relatively distant future at a time when consumers have indicated that they're, they're not going to consume their whole paycheck right now. They're going to defer some of that purchasing for the future. So in other words, interest rates coordinate time. When people are going to buy in the future, producers produce in anticipation of the future. So if people are going to tamp down their consumption in the present, well, this is a time for producers to engage in long-term product development. 
so that there's a time connection. Secondly, when I save, when we all save, what we're really doing is we've earned a paycheck and that paycheck is we get because we provided some good or service. And that paycheck, in effect, entitles us to go back into the economy and claim some goods for ourselves. But when we save, what we're actually doing is saying, well, I'm not going to go back into the economy and claim all the goods I'm entitled to. I'm going to leave some of them out there. Well, these unconsumed goods provide the material wherewithal to see businesses' new investment projects through to completion. So it coordinates it. So businesses start projects at a time when there's more stuff available to employ in the projects. And the structure of interest rates coordinates this. Now, Hayek says that when you tamper with interest rates, the result is, and that's what we've had for years, is Alan Greenspan, uh, before, the guy before Ben Bernanke, the Fed chairman, tampering with interest rates as if this is a, pa a, is a shortcut to prosperity. If it were, then Bangladesh should just build a Federal Reserve system, force interest rates down, and solve all their problems. So what Hayek says is that interest rates come down naturally because you and I save more. When we save more, the banks have more to lend, brings the interest rate down. And that's good because we've saved more, so we're indicating that we're going to consume not so much in the present but in the future. And secondly, we've saved more, which means we have released resources into the economy for use by uh, entrepreneurs. Good. That is the foundation of sound, sustainable economic growth. However, suppose the interest rate comes down simply because the central bank, the government's central bank, artificially forces it down. Well, then, Hayek says, we get much different economic consequences. Instead of sound economic growth, we're going to get boom and bust. Because in this case, Businessmen are going to be uh, enticed because now you know, the financing is much easier for a long-term project. Uh, and so projects that are the most interest rate sensitive and, and that are, tend to be the farthest removed in time from consumer goods like mining or construction, they're going to get a stimulus because they're very interest rate sensitive. Interest rates come down, they're going to start building. But now they're building at a time when consumers have not indicated that they're going to wait for the future to consume. They're consuming right now. Secondly, people have not released any additional resources to complete all the new projects. Just because Alan Greenspan forces interest rates down, that doesn't create any more lumber. It doesn't create any more steel, any more consumer goods. So now investors are going to start investment projects from an unchanged resource pool, and there just aren't enough, there's not enough physical stuff to complete all the things they thought they could. Their costs are going to go up because they're now competing for factors of production that are in less abundance than they expected them to be. And so Hayek, in effect, says that when you do this, you introduce discoordination throughout the whole economic system. And so instead of smooth economic growth, you get uh, an artificial boom and then a bust. And Mises gives a great analogy here. He says, think of the economy as being like a master builder who is building a house, but he's under a misapprehension about the supply of bricks he has. He thinks he's got 20% more bricks than he really has, and will just, for the sake of argument, say he can't acquire any more. This is the brick supply in the economy. So he's building a house that he can't possibly finish. The physical resources do not exist for him to finish the type of house he's building. If he had known how many bricks he had, he'd build a different type of house. A house that required only this supply. So now he's building and building and building. Well, eventually he's going to realize, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, I can't possibly finish this house. Now, is it better for him that he discover this error sooner or later? Well, obviously sooner, because then he will have wasted less of his time, fewer labor resources, fewer other physical resources, and he'll be able to say, well, I'm glad I didn't continue that project. That would have just squandered wealth. It would have hurt me. It would have made society poorer. If he waits to the end, well, then he's got to demolish practically a whole house, and obviously we're poorer for that. So what we're told when we get a downturn like this in our economy is that we just need to push interest rates lower still. Keep forcing them low. Force them to zero. Force them to, in fact, zero is too high, some people are saying. Zero is too high for interest rates. Force them to negative five. That should do it. Well, all that's saying is, that's in effect like saying that the, gee, the, uh, the master builder is, having, uh, is running into some trouble? Well, let's just uh, let's get the master builder drunk so that he's so tipsy he doesn't notice that his supply of bricks is dwindling and he'll just keep on building and be happy. Well, have you helped him? Is, is, is the bust any less inevitable now? He still doesn't have the physical resources. All you've done is made the problem much worse because when the bust comes, he's much poorer. Society's much poorer because we've blown all these extra resources that we wouldn't have blown 
if he had been forced to stop this project earlier. So in effect, what we see from the master builder example, and, I, and this is something that I feel funny saying just in a couple of sentences, but is that the recession period, strictly speaking, is not where the damage is done. The damage is done during the boom period, when the master builder is engaged in a project that he can't possibly complete. The structured demand, the existing resources do not correspond to it. He can't possibly complete it. It looks like prosperity because he's employed. And a lot of people think prosperity means jobs. Yeah, but if they're jobs doing things that are totally pointless, that's worse because that's worse, now you're going to make society poorer. So the damage is done in the boom. The recession is the period where he stops wasting resources and says, wait a minute, I have to do something totally different. The economy can't sustain what I'm doing. Well, to make a long story short, that's what's basically happened to us. Uh, and, and both producers and consumers have been on unsustainable binges. Producers have produced out of conformity with consumer demand, and consumers have been on unsustainable consumption binges. All this increase in the money supply by the Fed bid up housing prices to dramatically high levels, so everybody felt he was rich, and sure, five dollar cup of coffee at Starbucks is the least I can buy. You know, people just make crazy consumption decisions because they cannot see their net worth clearly. It's being obscured by the activities of the Fed. This is the key, the key thing. And now I've just said that if you try to paper over a recession by just saying, well, just throw more money at it, create more money out of thin air, sort of like a third grader response, you know, just print, oh, you're having problems? Print more money. Well, if you, if you do that and you put that through the banking system and you force interest rates still lower, again, all you're doing is continuing the economy on an unsustainable trajectory. You're just making it worse so that when the bust comes, it'll be worse than if you would just let it clear out in the beginning. Well, we have a real live example of this. Alan Greenspan, after the dot-com boom uh, bust, that went bust, he was getting tired of the economy turning down. So by 2001, he's saying, you know, I'm sick of this whole bust thing. But let's, let's get a boom going. So we get like 11 rate cuts in 2001. And so instead of letting, again, the unsustainable boom of the, that previous period clear out, let, let all these investment decisions that were unwise be liquidated and get rechanneled into productive sectors, instead, the economy was still partly sick. And interestingly, that 2001 recession, that's the first recession on record in which housing starts did not decline. So people drew the conclusion that housing is always robust. Even in a recession, housing is great. So housing prices can never go down. Um, a house is the best investment you can make. Flipping houses is a good way to make a living. All these sort of Fed-fueled uh, misapprehensions get started right then because Greenspan wouldn't let the economy clear out then. So now the bust that we have now is much worse because of this juvenile attempt to keep prosperity going artificially. Well, that I'm sure is, uh, I'm coming up on, the, on my, my full 60 minutes. So what we need to do is, first of all, educate ourselves. We all have to know this stuff. Uh, secondly, educate people we know. And that doesn't mean hand them human action by Mises. It's 900 pages. You have to ease people into this. Don't tell them that eventually you are giving them a copy of Human Action. They won't even start. But it can be finding a good YouTube that just makes this argument. And if you email me, I can give you some suggestions on that. Uh, it can be just giving them an article that you found persuasive. Whatever. Because some pe people will say, you know, I got turned on to this because somebody gave me an, an, an article or a book. So we have to basically do, we have to do this. We have to ask ourselves, what more can we do to spread this information? Because they are, they are going to destroy our country right now. They are, this is a watershed moment in American history. If we don't do something, if we don't say to ourselves, whatever I've done up to now for the cause of freedom, I have to double it. If this isn't the moment that we do it, then this is the greatest, most significant missed opportunity of our lifetimes. Now, the free market is libeled all the time, but all it means is that what you do in the division of labor has to be aimed toward pleasing your fellow man. You are rewarded for doing something that pleases him. You are punished for doing something that makes him worse off. You produce in a free market for a mass market. You don't just produce luxuries for a few. You produce things for everyone that begin as luxuries, but then, because people wanting to make profit don't want to sell to just 10 people, they want to adapt it for production for a mass market. When you engage in transactions on a free market, you need the consent of both parties, so it respects the dignity of both individuals. Nobody can, just, nobody can treat somebody else as just a, a thing to be exploited. Uh, 
There are what Frederick Bossi had called economic harmonies on the free market. I have something that I'm good at, you have something that you're good at, and we find mutual advantage in trading with each other. Uh, this is the opposite of every other type of economic system that involves some type of warfare between individuals. So I hope you will, if, if you don't necessarily buy a copy of my book, uh, I hope you might, though, go to my website, tomwoods.com, because on there I've got a list of, of what, what should I read if you're wondering, where do I even get started? Well, I, I've developed some reading lists, and, and it's, in, in case you're wondering, yeah, it's all his stuff, right? You know, you have to order it through his website. No, it isn't. I mean, there are a couple things of mine, but they're not even essential um, on the list. Um, on the articles page of my website, I've got a couple of, of um, lists for this, and I've also got MP3s. So if you say, I don't have time to read books, that's no excuse. You can put it on your iPod and listen in the car. But, you know, beginning, intermediate, advanced, I've got it all up there at TomWoods.com, so I hope you'll check that out. But let me conclude with uh, what Ludwig von Mises said. Economics must not be relegated to classrooms and statistical offices, and must not be left to esoteric circles. It is philosophy of human life and action and concerns everybody and everything. It is the pith of civilization and of man's human existence. And he went on to say, and this is obviously so relevant for our situation, everyone carries a part of society on his shoulders. No one is relieved of his share of responsibility by others. And no one can find a safe way out for himself if society is sweeping toward destruction. Therefore, everyone in his own interests must thrust himself vigorously into the intellectual battle. None can stand aside with unconcern. The interest of everyone hangs on the result. Whether he chooses or not, every man is drawn into the great historical struggle, the decisive battle into which our epoch has plunged us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good luck to us all in that decisive battle. Thank you so much.